It, instead of starting an OnlyFans, I got this video sponsored by AdamandEve.com. Get 50% off and free shipping on something weird from the code in the description. <laughs> Warning, the following game does not endorse terrorism, nor the violation of people's privacy to fight terrorism. Are, uh, are, are video games okay right now? I've been writing this video over the course of what's probably going to be the most historically decisive year since 2001. People are dying and, and losing their jobs and, and all locked up, losing their minds. But at least we have video games. The resilience of the video game business is something we've been seeing in even the smallest of the small fry productions, even in the games that are more like hobbies or side jobs than businesses. Even in all these relatively unknown games that still have a whole bunch of heart and soul and hard work and talent put into them, despite enduring the worst conditions. This is a series where I showcase games that haven't gotten much media coverage. If I've even heard of it before, or if a whole mess of media coverage comes up when I google it, it doesn't count. It's a collection of projects strung together during both the best and worst of times. A spicy and sweet catalog of games that'll alternate from making you feel stressed out to making you feel soothed out. If you want to use gameplay to explore the mechanics behind the insanity of what we're all seeing, or if you need to take an escapist break to keep you sane, welcome to the scariest edition of Games From My Inbox. Ever since Papers, Please gamified the dystopia of work, I've been loving games that get real heavy with the symbolism behind the tokens you're throwing around. Not For Broadcast is a desk work simulator in which your job is broadcasting the news under increasingly oppressive rules. Real-time video editing is the gameplay mechanic here. You're flicking between different feeds of FMV videos telling a procedural black comedy ripped from today's headlines and plugged into a nostalgic 80s aesthetic to give your clicks that satisfying physical feel of tossing around tapes of analog media. You need to keep the focus on interesting camera angles showing who's talking and who's reacting while trying to focus your ears on multiple audio feeds of chatter for context clues on when it's your cue to cut to commercials or bring us back from the break. Your eyes are parsing through multiple stories simultaneously whose flavor dialogue reveals, through some retries, more and more secrets about what's going on as you pay attention to angles that you might have missed before. Once the cameras are rolling, a person can start acting like a completely different person. Which side of their story do you want to show, and which side does your boss want to show? Give us a look at Megan's reaction. Lovely. Now back to Thunder Twat. One of the more important things I like about games like this isn't just the intensity of the job or the humor of the actors and their stories, but how some gameplay elements help explain a bit about how the real world works. Having an editor standing by listening for audio cues must be why news anchors always spend a good few seconds saying that now we're signing off, it's time to head back to George for tonight's garbage report. And to cool things off, Jet Island is a VR game about being Spider-Man on top of a hoverboard with a gun. This is a Sam Raimi simulator. So okay, you have two jet thrusters with unlimited fuel attached to your hands, two hook shots you can reel yourself away up towers with, and a Counter-Strike surfing map full of half pipes and luge tunnels that propel you into the air where you shoot at giant geometric monsters that shoot back to keep you moving. It's like if the Green Goblin was playing Shadow of the Colossus and that experience is getting injected straight into your eyeballs. All the rudimentary game developer art hides that responsive high-speed fun, as well as the always enjoyable experience of seeing what kind of new heights and speed look like from your own first-person perspective. Do not play this on a full stomach, and maybe have a fan blowing on you to sell the feeling of that speed you're getting here. It's easy to dismiss this one by its graphics, alongside other countless prototype-looking Unity VR games out there, and that's probably why more people haven't talked about this. Just the one guy who recommended it showing up in my inbox. Six years ago, I really got into a quaint little medieval town builder called Banished. It was unique for gamifying the hardships of pre-industrial agrarian living. Then Fallout 4 came out and it got my mind going about how interesting a post-apocalyptic town builder could be. Then some German developers decided to smack the two concepts together so hard that Inzone, a world apart, is barely legally distinct from just being banished by any other name. 
But hey, don't fix it if it ain't broken. Inzone is a tent village builder that is unique for gamifying some of the more non-violent conflicts of sustaining a remote community living off some radioactive, war-scarred land. Which, in practice, means a lot of the same challenges of Banished, like soothing out agrarian supply chains, strategically timing up your harvesting, and making sure the population doesn't go over or under the level needed to keep everyone's job productive. Banished with guns it may be, but there's a few quality of life features that put it above Banished's bar. Like a build next button so you can queue construction up, mouse over tooltips for yields, there's some jobs you can stamp down without buildings that kind of operate like buildings, side missions to keep you awake and progressing, savable camera shortcut spots, and roaming herds of deer that you actually gotta track around the map and hunt down for food. Thanks to the post-apocalyptic setting, it's also got a bit more urgency and difficulty than Banished. Still mostly about hashing out a graph of tasks, pressing the fast forward button, and waiting for a problem to crop up, but now those problems include things like drought, sandstorms, radiation, and poison rain. By all means, it's a decent town builder in its own right. Pro probably the biggest criticism it's gonna face is that it's so much like Banished after all. Then again, that kind of sort of means that if you haven't played Banished before, you could do pretty darn well by starting here. On the lighter side of things, Pinko Park is an inspired Pokemon Snap spiritual successor. A wildlife photography game aimed at a younger audience that doesn't gotta worry about the hyper-technical demand of having to walk around by means of their own locomotion. You passively ride a cart through some five-minute vignette courses while struggling to get close-up shots of cute and creepy animals doing their thing. Like a little mushroom boy named Shrump. But there's a bit more emphasis on the creepy here, with its unpredictable animals drawn in a style big on bulbous bodies with expressive toothy mouths crossing over into the second dimension to make it feel like you're always being watched. The gameplay challenge comes from how efficient you can make those five-minute minecart rides, making sure you capitalize on brief windows of opportunity that can be counted down in frames. Just as in Pokemon Snap, unlockable gadgets gradually give you a bit of a sandbox of animal interactions that can trigger them into striking surprising poses that'll earn points, that'll unlock more gadgets, that'll unlock alternate pathways, that'll lead to hidden areas, that'll give you intriguing flavor text, that'll unlock additional levels later on while encouraging that you backtrack again with new gear. And it all gradually builds up into a short and sweet, dense and memorable narrative experience. There's a spooky, slightly sadistic atmosphere here, suggesting that something has gone terribly wrong at Penko Park. Don't believe his lies. A lot of the stuff that shows up in my inbox kind of gives the impression that it was made by a crazy dude. Uh, according to interviews with Old School Gamer magazine, weed and beer were the two highest expenses that went into this 10-year-long game development project. Brigand Wohaka is one of the ugliest and most unstable games I've ever featured, but it wouldn't be up here if there wasn't a good dose of heart and soul and hard-ass work put into it. The credit screen mostly features the names of Brian Lancaster and not too many else besides stock music and deviant artists. There's graphics that are 22 years behind the times and constantly crashing spaghetti code that you can feel chugging and struggling behind your fingertips. But all of that overshadows the fact that this is a surprisingly feature-complete FPS RPG immersive sim done in the style of Deus Ex and System Shock 2. But the scrapyard scenery and the companions following you around everywhere remind me more of the 3D fallouts. Maybe that's why it looks like it's from 1999 and launches in 1024 by 768 after some horrible post-apocalyptic nuclear future where Florida has sunk beneath the ocean, the Caribbean is all underwater, and pirates have turned the powers that be into Fallout slash Stalker style warlords ruling through drugs and anarchy, your character wakes up being forced to work mercenary jobs for conflicting factions whose hostility against one another drives the choices and their consequences. Since this is a real deal FPS RPG, you'll be playing neutral and hostile AIs off each other to fight battles for you. You'll be destroying doors instead of unlocking them. You'll be wandering into a bunch of highly difficult, expansive environments that are just there to be the world. A lot of places that flesh out the map that could easily have nothing to do with your current quest goals. You'll rope together a party of companions whose inventory and skills you gotta micromanage, and you'll face a meat grinder of a difficulty wall unless you use everyone's skills and equipment to their max. Yeah, it looks bad, it feels bad, but what's so compelling is how the underlying simulation of 
such a budget effort, still manages to bring out that classic, emergent, and immersive gameplay. The stuff this game's inspirations are remembered for. In between the hard-won satisfaction that comes from using RPG skills, a bit of stealth, and some cleverness to overcome deliberately cumbersome combat, are the much more simple joys of exploring highly interactive, peaceful environments that bring the world building, with kitchens, beds, bathrooms, and sure enough, flushable toilets. But I can understand how just a few seconds of footage of that game are going to be way too nasty to keep looking at. So good news! The Germans also gamified the placid primordial pastime of bird watching. Wingspan is a card game that got turned into a computer game where you win by having the bigger, better bird sanctuary than the other players. Birds and a couple randomly chosen bonus conditions earn you victory points, but to get them nested in, you need to spend a few turns getting the infrastructure in place. It takes turns to get food, nest eggs, and to do some discarding and shuffling of your hand that'll line up a plan for you to use these bird powers for later on. The contest is a combination of luck of the draw and long drawn out strategy. There's not a lot of direct intervention going on between players, not a lot of metaphors for combat here. The one with the highest score at the end of the session wins. It's almost like competitive solitaire, except the rare moments of direct intervention come from, guess what, bird powers. So uh, if you want a passive, peaceful, pretty group activity that'll even stimulate a bit of pseudo-educational science talk to help keep you guys sane, here's one way to get that done. It's the exact opposite of the next game on the list. Bush tit. Bush tits live in flocks, and single adults will help couples raise their young. Gorst is a surrealistic nightmare of being trapped in a game developer's puzzle box hell, where the rules of the game itself are as bizarre as the psychedelic artwork. It's a Bomberman concept, a real-time action combat puzzle game more about reflexive, super-fast, head-to-head multiplayer arena combat than uh, stopping for a few minutes to think through a puzzle solution. So okay, I I'm gonna try to explain what you're seeing here. You can only move along these white trails, and when you do, it paints the trail your color. You win when all the trails on the map are painted your color. You can shoot a single bullet at the other competitors, which causes them to burst into a splash of your color, but that bullet will bounce back from hitting a wall and it'll kill you right back. You can hold down a button to catch it, you can also hold down other directional buttons to send it a single instruction to keep turning around a certain corner, but once that bullet's out in the wild, it's just as much an obstacle as the enemy's. If you lose track of what's happening where, it feels like that bullet might as well have a mind of its own. If you don't, you feel like a gorse damn genius. That satisfying puzzle game sensation of having to think two turns ahead of time comes from a more uh, spatial sort of thinking. It comes from mentally juggling the footprints that both you and your bullet are making on the map at once, while also comparing that to where the enemies are and thinking up some plan ahead of time. It's a hell of a mind trip. I, I, I don't think my brain has had to think through these kinds of problems before. When you've got a grasp of these concepts, GORST is fun as hell, and the sheer speed of the experience serves as a benefit, not a detriment. The game's blistering fast, but it's designed so that fortunes can be reversed in an instant. Covering a bunch of lost ground can happen in like one second with just two button presses. I, I can totally imagine some very intense and serious multiplayer communities propping up around this game if it got more exposure. Oh no, I gotta give a big gamer disclaimer. I'm plugging a friend's project. This could be a conflict of interest. I'm gonna get arrested if I don't say that. I co-host a podcast with Liam Edwards who made Curse to Golf earlier this year, which means I'm gonna say it's a poopy bad game for dumb people who like garbage. It's got these busy side-scrolling 2D levels with alternate pathways and explosive obstacles. Hitting the ball anywhere causes all sorts of chaos that you gotta scope out ahead of time using these consumable power-ups, but it's not like I have the patience to use precision and strategy here. You gotta get creative with your understanding of the physics engine since you can only hit the ball in one direction, but I mean come on, in real golf you can hit the ball in any direction through three-dimensional time and space. Get it together, game developers. A lot of our fans have called this game the Dark Souls of Golf, but if there's a poisonous swamp patrolled by blow dart snipers somewhere in there, I haven't gotten to that part yet. Just a bunch of water hazards. <clears throat> 
And if that wasn't a moral quandary enough, then also know that this video was sponsored by AdamandEve.com, your number one source for adult toys and novelties and other such products that you'd rather arrive at your family's home with discreet shipping, 24-7 customer service, 90-day no-hassle returns. AdamandEve.com with the code BUNNYHOP will get you 50% off one item with free shipping. And with almost 50 years in the business and a socially conscious mission, that has your money going to fight HIV, I, uh, d d don't feel that shameful about it. Thank you for watching, and thank you for sponsoring.